Good evening, everyone. Welcome to All right, now I think we have sound. <laughs> okay, I was just informed we didn't have any sound, so let's start over again. Welcome, welcome to uh, Word on Wednesdays. I had said earlier that I want to move quickly through these announcements, but now we got to kind of repeat ourselves. But that's okay. Um, hey, just uh, good to have you with us and good to be here with you. Um, there's a new sermon series coming up this Sunday. I want to tell you about that first off. Set your mind on things above. It's a sentence from Colossians 3, verse 2. Set your mind on things above. And um, I guess I should be setting my mind on the things I'm doing right now. Uh, but at any rate, the, uh, the uh, series will talk about our spiritual life, our walk with Christ, and, and, and uh, what some of the things are entailed with that. Uh, that are entailed with that. Um, we've talked about the big picture kind of things in the, the 10 C's series. This is a more, well, I hate to say down to earth since we're setting our mind on things above, but how do we live here on earth with our minds focused on things above? And how do we live for him? And, and what role do we play in his overall plan for all things? Okay. Um, and then this Coming up in June, this is a kind of a neat thing. Uh, people have been wondering, I'm sure, when are we going to get back to, to church? June the 7th, uh, we won't be going back into the church building, per se, for service for a service. We will be doing a drive-in church service in the parking lot. We're hoping the weather will be more cooperative, maybe a little bit warmer, maybe no snow like we had last Saturday, right? Uh, maybe we'll be out of that zone or whatever for, for weather. Uh, be be crazy if there was snow in June and the way 2020 has been going, who knows? But at any rate, 10 o'clock in the morning on that Sunday morning, we're going to have a service out in the parking lot. So more details will be coming for that. So you, you'll be watching for that and, and so forth. Um, the other thing I wanted to... To, to say is I wanted to give some thanks to some people. 
Uh, I think I have done that before, but it just really has been helpful as we've been doing this online thing. Uh, some folks have, have expressed gratitude to me and everything, and, 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 I, and I appreciate that. It's an encouragement to continue to do it. Um, but I also want to say thanks uh, to, to uh, Tina Shawbreck. Uh, just thank you so much, Tina, for your, your work with the uh, the music and putting that together. Um, and uh, I just it, it just really has been a big help at putting together a service. Uh, she's been working on things as we've gone along in, in improving what she's doing and changing it up, trying new things. And, and that's been fantastic and, and uh, really has aided a lot. And I wanted to also send the thanks out to Steve Alger um, and just the... Uh, uh, the, the different things he's done with the YouTube channel he started up. He's been taking the, the services. He takes this and, and makes uh, YouTube videos out of it, loads them up there. And uh, as, as other things that are available, we can get things on CD for you. If you want that, we can work that out because uh, he's been because of the work he's been doing with this. He's converted some of this stuff to MP3 uh, audio files. And, and so fantastic. So I just wanted to send out thank yous to each of those guys. Now, just to get things started here, I guess some of you are saying, well, there's a symbol on your shirt or something on your shirt. What in the world is that? Well, here's what the shirt looks like. I've done this before just to let you know. And, and some of you are thinking, oh my goodness, that is the all-seeing eye from the back of the dollar bill. And, uh, and uh, maybe you think of that as being the eye of God. Uh, you'll see it says conspiracy theorist on there. Kind of a fun t-shirt for me to get. Um, just wanted to explain something about it. Why am I wearing it tonight? I am a conspiracy theorist of a sort. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, I believe that uh, Satan has a plan. We've talked about God's plan uh, Satan also has a plan, a plan he's been working on for quite some time, a plan that's moving forward. We'll talk about some of those things in the lesson tonight. So there is a conspiracy there, a conspiring together with other uh, evil forces, uh, forces that work with him, supernatural, spiritual evil forces that work under him and with him to, towards that goal. And also, I believe, throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia, there have been humans that have been involved in that as well. And so, yes, I do believe that there is a conspiracy of some sort. It may not take the form of things that you have heard, um, and as far as conspiracies go, but there's been a conspiring. I, I don't see how you can uh, be a Christian and not think about some kind of conspiring going on with the way things are described in the Bible. At least being a biblical Christian, uh, would, as that would be the case. So anyhow, let's uh, move along here with our uh, lesson for tonight, and you'll see how some of these things connect with that. We've been moving right along in our study of these seven letters written by Jesus himself to seven churches along the western region of Asia Minor, or as we know the nation today, Turkey. Okay. Last week we spent most of the lesson discussing concepts and principles uh, from Jesus' letter to Ephesus. Remember the emphasis we had there on valuing the uh, works, the toil, and, and the patience that Jesus was emphasizing that the Ephesians were practicing in their church. Uh, and we talked about how those things, work, toil, patience, they have to flow from true love of Jesus. I mean loving Jesus, okay, and, and truly loving him. They have to come from that. Uh, otherwise, if you don't have the love, uh, the works eventually are not going to amount to much of anything. The Ephesians had left their first love of Jesus Christ, even though uh, their works were commendable. Uh, the question would be kind of implied, how long can those works go on? Eventually, he said he would uh, basically put their lights out. He'd, he'd take the light away if they didn't repent and turn around. I mentioned to you in just about uh, that nearly every one of these letters has, uh, Jesus has a commendation for the church in hand. He has a criticism that he lays out. He also provides instruction to them as to what to do about that. And, and he also pr provides a promise to them. Now, not every church is commended. Not every church is criticized. But each one is given instruction and a promise. 
The church at Ephesus is commended for rejecting evil, for toiling in service, and for enduring patiently, as we've said. But she's criticized that her love of Christ is no longer fervent. The church is instructed, do those works which you did at the first. And she's promised the tree of life. Now, Smyrna was the other church that we looked at, the persecuted church. They were suffering for their faith at the hands of Jews uh, who, were, who say they were Jews but were not Jews. Remember, it said that in the letter. They rejected Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. They didn't see Jesus of Nazareth as being their Messiah. And in his words, they were therefore the synagogue of Satan. And, and as I was thinking about that this week, I, I remembered Jesus' words to Jewish leadership in John chapter 8. It's in around verses 43, 44, as I remember correctly. Uh, if you take a look there at those verses, John 8, 43, 44, he says, You do the works of your father, and of the father, the devil. You're doing the works of your father, the devil. So see, there's a precedent here for him talking about this synagogue of Satan. The church at Smyrna is commended by Christ for gracefully bearing up under suffering. Okay, Jesus has no criticism for this particular church, this persecuted church. He promises them uh, the crown of life, instructing them to be faithful even unto death. And tonight, we're going to be looking at Jesus' letters to both Pergamum and Thyatira. This will take us from Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, and go through verse 29 to the end of the chapter there. So let's go into the passage for Pergamum, starting with that church here. Uh, verse 12 of chapter 2, To the angel of the church at Pergamum, write this, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Very interesting. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives." Keep those thoughts in mind. Jesus goes on, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, now, we saw the Nicolaitans in the letter to the church at Ephesus last week. He tells them here in, the, in Ephesus, or in the, uh, rather in Pergamum, Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth, which is the word of God. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna, I will also give that person a white stone with a new name on it, known only to the one who receives it. So, in Jesus' letter here to the uh, this church at Pergamum, he commends them for um, keeping the faith. He criticizes them for uh, though for tolerating this cult of idolatry and immorality. Jesus instructs this church to repent of that sin, and he promises them hidden manna and a stone which has a new name. And speaking of names, I want to look now at the name of the city, Pergamos. And that's what was on the screen a moment ago there with a beautiful bride and, and groom there. Uh, look at uh, the word gamos there. The Greek word gamos means marriage. Okay, and this crops up in English, as you can see with the examples I've given. We talk of monogamy, being married to one person. That's the, that's the, the way God designed things, one man, one woman for life. Okay, being married to one. Uh, then there's also the word bigamy, married to two people. 
All right, so that's a, a threesome in a home. Uh, just fraught with difficulty, as you might imagine. And it's one of the reasons, probably the primary reason, God says, don't do that. You know, you're going to have some major headaches. And then there's polygamy, married to two or more. And uh, that became something in the Middle East, especially as a sign of a man's power by how many women he had in his home, his wives and concubines, and so on and so forth. But notice there's also another word down there, word one you're likely not familiar with. It's the word pergamy. Like bigamy and polygamy, pergamy carries negative connotations. Pergamy is where a person of one social class... Um, marries a person of another social class. And another way to refer to this is to call it a mixed marriage, meaning a mixture of two social classes together in a home. And that seemed to be quite difficult uh, in most situations. Here in America, in some ways, actually, we kind of celebrate this, this idea. We love the story of Cinderella who in such a pitiful state of abuse that she was enduring under her wicked stepmother and her evil stepsisters, nonetheless, she breaks free from her societal bonds and she marries the prince of the land. Walt Disney celebrated that marriage with all kinds of bells and ringing as the, the newlyweds climb into their coach. And, and, you know, we're just, we're rooting for Cinderella all the way through, you know. Yay, she got who, you know, the, the, the prince or whatever. So, uh, but even with all of that, nonetheless, the Greek prefix per, P-E-R, does mean mixed and it means it with a negative tone in most instances. For example, our term for a wrong or twisted version of the norm is a perversion of what is acceptable. In the case of pergamy, then, this mixed marriage is objectionable. And in the church in Pergamum, there's an objectionable, object, objectionable mixture of marriage of people who hold to truth you know, the truth of the Christian faith, nevertheless, they are tolerant of, and they're living with this cult of idolaters and sexually immoral people. It's pergamy. And, and just to uh, emphasize this, they, this is, <clears throat> these are people who are uh, not in the community or something like that. They are in the church. They're engaged. They're involved. They're having an influence on the church body. Okay, the church is to be in a called out assembly of believers in Christ. It's okay to have lost people, people who are outside of the faith, come into the church and, and, and become part of the church, come to faith in Christ, and that way they become part of the pool of believers and so forth. So it's not that we're saying no visitors or anything, that, that you know, no one's allowed other than people that believe. You've got to know the secret code or password or something crazy like that. Now, we're not talking about that, but we... The case here is having people who um, are in the church, but nonetheless have these wrong, radical, untruthful lies, heinous lies, which stand to destroy the witness of the church and, and the, the spiritual nature of it. And uh, so anyway, let's get into the details here of uh, this letter to Pergamos. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Now, in chapter 1, uh, these, these uh, letters often begin with a description of Christ that comes from the description of him in chapter 1. In chapter 1, we saw that the glorified Lord Jesus had this sharp, double-edged sword coming from his mouth. This sword, therefore, is to be understood as his word, okay, as the word of truth, um, in chapter 1, verse 16, it says, In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. Okay, so this is the reference back to chapter 1. If there is anyone who is able to break apart this mixed marriage of truth and lies, it is the Lord Jesus Christ, through the powerful truth of his word. All right, that the, the, the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, able to divide asunder soul and spirit. It's like a hair-splitting kind of a, of a tool. It's a, it's a spiritual surgical tool 
a spiritual scalpel, if you will, to uh, do surgery where it is needed. We'll have some more thought about that a little later on, but let's take a look now at verse 13. I'm going to have a lot of slides up here tonight, so you, for your, fortunately for you, you won't see me very much. Anyway, verse 13 says, I, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce my faith, your faith in me, uh, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Antipas, let's focus on him for a moment. Antipas was probably the pastor of the church in Pergamum. John MacArthur reports that church tradition teaches, uh, let's see here, sorry I got lost. It teaches, church tradition teaches, that Antipas was placed inside of a brass bull where he was burned to death. All right, that was his means of being put to death. Wikipedia says this, Saint Antipas is referred to in the book of Revelation, Revelation 2.13, as the faithful martyr of Pergamon, where Satan dwells. According to Christian tradition, John the Apostle ordained Antipas as bishop of the Pergamon during the reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian, who was one who persecuted many Christians at that time. The traditional account goes on to say that Antipas was martyred in circa 92 AD by burning in a brass bull-shaped altar used for casting out demons worshipped by the local population. Okay, here is a, a, a representation of what it may have been like. You see the door at the top where the victim was put inside of the brass bull. Fire lit underneath, and that's represented by the display there. And it's just impossible to even imagine how horrible that must have been uh, for people to have to endure. It took place at the, the altar of Zeus in the city of Pergamum. Looking again here at verse 13, we see that Jesus commends the Christians at Pergamum for remaining faithful to his name. You have, you've remained true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me. Even when their pastor was put to death like this, they didn't renounce their faith, even though they knew they were risking their own lives. And this is very commendable since this is where the chief adversary of the faith has his headquarters in the city of Pergamum. Look at what Jesus says here. Satan has his throne in Pergamum, and Satan lives in your city in Pergamum. Over the last couple of years, I've been thinking a lot about cities, earthly cities, cities within this world's system here and the potential for multiplying evil influences in them and from them and through them. Good things happen in cities. I'm not totally throwing cities under the city bus, as it were. Uh, I'm just simply saying that the possibility exists for a rapid dispersion of, of evil throughout and to have an influence beyond the borders of that city, right? Beyond the city limits and out into the world around them. Just to, to kind of back it up, just with me, consider the the uh, um, the different cities as talked about in the Bible. Let's go way back to the beginning, Genesis chapter four. After Cain murders his brother Abel, he leaves where he was. He takes a wife where he goes, and then he founds a city himself, and he names that city Enoch for his son. Okay, it always seems to be a magnifying of the name of, of a person that happens with cities. Just, that's not bad, is it? I'm just saying it seems to be that. Genesis 4 tells us that Enoch had a son by the name of Irad, I-R-A-D. Irad had a son named Mahujael. Mahujael fathered Methushael. And Methushael fathered a guy by the name of Lamech. The interesting thing about Lamech is he becomes the first bigamist in the Bible. All right? He marries two women, 
Ada and Zillah. He had wives from A to Z. Okay, all right, that's why I always remember the, their names. Anyway, and, and with those two women, he had four children. He had three sons and a daughter. And Lamech's three sons seem to have played key roles in the establishment of civilization. Again, making me think of cities, okay? There's the de development of agriculture. One of the sons does that. Another one is involved with technology. And a third one, uh, into the arts. If you have uh, a, a means of providing food for everyone and a system to take care of a large group of people with food, and if you have technology that goes along with doing that sort of thing, as well as other things that can happen that can turn into trade and so forth, and then you have the arts. If you have time, then leisure time to be able to write songs, to make instruments, to play them, to uh, make uh, you know drawings and, and to sculpt things and produ produce plays and so forth. Um, you, you know, you're, you've got a pretty uh, uh, developed civilization there for, for that kind of thing. Survival is not your uh, most significant and only struggle that you have. Uh, and then there's the daughter. The daughter's name is given. The, the boy's names are given too. But it's interesting to me, she's the, uh, how did I have it figured? Let's see, there was Eve, and then there's Ada and Zilla, okay? And then there's the daughter, Naama, N-A-A-M-A-H, Naama. And she may well, it doesn't say in the Bible about this, but from other Jewish literature and other writings, Naama seems to have influenced occult worship and practices. So you have this development of religion, but notice it's not a religion worshiping God in the city. No, it's it's a false religion, an occult religion, um, and uh, more akin to that eye that I have on here. <laughs> uh, you know, the it's not the eye of God. Okay, that's the eye of Osiris. Actually, is what that actually represents. And there's a whole bunch of baggage with that symbol uh, associated with it, but we don't have time to get into that now. But all this begins to happen, and then the great flood came. Okay, let's move ahead to the next slide here. After the flood, we have this guy, Nimrod. Nimrod built cities after the flood, several cities, as outposts of his growing empire. You can read about him in Genesis chapter 10. It's a genealogy for the most part, but Nimrod appears in there, okay, um, uh, under, well, I'm not going to remember the name, so I'm not going to say, Cush, I think, is, is mentioned in there, and I forget, Cush, does he come from, uh, I, I forget, never mind, I'll try not to remember, um, Japheth, maybe, uh, but most likely Ham, I think it's Ham, yeah, He's a descendant of Ham. So anyway, Nimrod builds these cities. Uh, he builds Babel, the city of Babel, which is important, right? There's a city, Erech, Erech, uh, like Iraq, Iraq today. Okay, Erech is, is one of the cities. Akkad, Kalna, Nineveh, that's a city where um, Jonah uh, was supposed to go to and eventually got there. Then there was Rehoboth Beach, another city. Oh, I'm sorry, that's Rehoboth Ur, not Rehoboth Beach. Uh, then there's Kala and, and Resin. Okay, Babel. Babel was, of course, noted for the tower and the city, which were built lest we be scattered over the face of the earth. See, that's a direct disobedience to God's uh, command to fill the earth and to replenishment, replenish it. Cities of evil here, okay? These are cities of evil. This, this is what I'm talking about, cities. This becomes important. We're not leaving our, our Revelation 2 series at all here. Not surprisingly, uh, when it comes to cities, the city that is most mentioned in the Bible is the city of Jerusalem, Okay, that's, that's not surprising that Jerusalem would be the most common city referenced in the Bible. But do you know what city holds second place in the Bible? The second most mentioned city in the Bible. It's Babylon. Babylon, which is the very antithesis, the very opposite of Jerusalem. Jerusalem represents the city, the city of God or the kingdom of God. Babylon is the kingdom of man. That means humans under control of other humans empowered by supernatural evil because they have abandoned God. 
Babylon was founded by Nimrod. All right, Babel. And, then, and Babylon becomes then a type of the world system, the ungodly, wicked system of this world. This world system persists to this very day, and one day it will culminate in the rise of the Antichrist. I believe that the Antichrist will be a real person. The Bible teaches about the coming of such a person. I also think the Antichrist represents the spirit of the age, the ungodly spirit of the cosmos, which is the Greek word for this world system. Okay, the Antichrist, the apostle taught the spirit of Antichrist was present in his day. Antichrist means not against Christ, although there is that aspect. It primarily means replacing Christ or taking the place of Christ. All right, children, it is the last hour, says John in 1 John 2, verse 18. It is the last hour, and has, as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrist have come. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Hey, that's what those Jews were doing in Smyrna, those Jews who said they were Jews and were not, because they denied that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. Okay, those who deny that, this is the Antichrist. See, he's not the Christ, somebody else is, or I am. Jesus said in prophecy in Matthew 24, many will come in my name saying, I am Christ, and they will deceive many. Okay, this is Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. See, it's a complete rejection and rebellion against God that takes place here. Satan temporarily has control over this cosmos, folks. He has temporarily has control over the world system. The Bible teaches us this. When, G when he tempted Jesus, Satan made a legitimate offer to Jesus uh, to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. You know, if he you know, if he didn't have control over those kingdoms, it's not a legitimate temptation, but it's a real temptation. He had those, has those kingdoms under his control at this time, and he offers them to Jesus if Jesus would bow down and worship him. So see, Satan is looking for a time. He's looking for a place. He's looking for a place, uh, a city, He's looking for a person, the Antichrist, in order for him to make his move into ruling the earthly arena in a much more direct fashion than what he's done up to this point. He's looking for a kingdom. He's looking to take the place of Christ. Hence, his interest in cities. They figure into his plan ever since the day of Nimrod and the origin of Babylon. And Jesus says at the time of John the Apostle, Satan is has his throne in the city of Pergamum. Okay, now what does that mean, that he's got his throne there? Well, in part, it means forging a link between truth and falsehood, between the true church of Christ and the false belief systems of the world. This is a mixed marriage, folks. This is Pergamy. The main false belief system in Pergamum at that time was the worship of Zeus. And here is a look at the great altar of Zeus. We've already seen it in the background of some of our slides tonight. This stood in the city of Pergamum. Now take a look at that structure. Just look at the form of it. You've got that long section built across the rear of the structure. And note the two wings that come off the each, each end, each at a right angle to that rear portico. The whole structure looks remarkably like an armchair. Can't you imagine someone sitting there, their back resting against that, and then their arms on either side? Uh, it, it looks like a throne. Well, isn't this the city where Satan has his throne? Now, notice here in this next slide, Zeus sit, sitting on his throne. Okay? Uh, this is a, an artist's depiction of the real statue of Zeus at Olympia, Greece. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. No longer exists, okay? But this is a representation of what it may have looked like. And the, the straight back throne uh, with the uh, straight out arms at the side, very much like what we just saw in that other image here. Let me just put that kind of in the background so you can sort of see. You get a sense there. 
of the throne-like structure of the great altar of Zeus at Pergamum. Jesus said that Satan's throne was at Pergamum. It's not too hard to see what Jesus was referring to, is it? Here's the great altar of Zeus. Again, the Pergamum altar. Let me get to it here. Uh, also known as uh, the Pergamum altar. Once again, it should be fairly obvious to you. Take a look there that this building is not on a hillside somewhere in, in Turkey. It's not out in the open with sunlight. It's inside of another building. It's housed inside of another building, one that was built especially for it. Okay, the Pergamon altar dates to the second century BC. That's 200 years before Christ. And it's inside the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, Germany. Wikipedia says, in 1878, the German architect Karl Humann, H-U-M-A-N-N, -N, kind of like human with an extra N, which I find kind of fascinating. The German engineer Karl Humann began official excavations on the Acropolis of Pergamon, an effort that lasted until 1886. So eight years, they're, they're digging this up. The excavation was undertaken in order to rescue the altar friezes. That's F-R-I-E-Z-E-S. It's talking about the artistic representations, the sculptures around the base of this, this structure, okay, the foundation. Uh, it was to rescue those and also to expose the foundation of the edifice, according to Wikipedia. And it goes on. Later, other ancient structures on the Acropolis were brought to light. Upon negotiating with the Turkish government, remember, per Pergamum is in western Turkey, okay? Uh, they participated in the excavation, uh, and an agreement was given with them. It was agreed that all freeze fragments found at the time would become the property of the Berlin museums, okay? Now, once all the, this, this got to Berlin, Italian restorers came in to work on it probably Renaissance experts or something, and they reassembled the panels comprising the frieze from the thousands of fragments that had been recovered. See, they picked up this whole thing piece by piece and moved it to Germany, to Berlin. In order to display the result and create a context for it, a new museum was erected in 1901 on Berlin's Museum Island. Because the first Pergamon, this first Pergamon Museum proved to be both inadequate and structurally unsound, it was demolished in 1909 and replaced with a much larger museum, which opened in 1930. And this new museum is still open to the public on the island, and that's the museum building that you see it housed in there. Now think about this. Everything was shipped by train from Turkey to Berlin. All this stuff loaded up on trains and shipped from Turkey to Berlin. And by the time they got the new museum built and opened, it was 1930. The new museum opened in 1930 in Berlin. Now ask yourself, what was just starting to happen in Berlin in 1930, folks? In September of 1930, Adolf Hitler's Nazi party gained a victory in the Reichstag. They gained 107 seats. And in 1933, Hitler was named Chancellor of Germany. Now I want you to check something out here on this next slide. Anybody recognize this building? This is the Zeppelinfeld Stadium in Nuremberg, Germany. This was designed by Nazi architect Albert Speer for Adolf Hitler. This was the place where Hitler gave the majority of his highly influential speeches, winning over the German people, telling them, this despondent people who lost a lot in the First World War, telling them of their racial superiority. You are a superior race. You see, Hitler believed that the 1930 opening of the Pergamon Museum, housing the great altar of Zeus, he saw that because he was a, an occultic kind of person, thought a lot of the occult, held it in high regard, thought of power in these old things, these old gods, and so forth. 
He saw this as an omen of his own rise to power. Wow, it opens in 1930, and look now, here I am. I'm getting a blessing, so to speak, from this altar. That's kind of what he says. He's, he's thinking. So he has Albert Speer create this design for this large Zeppelinfeld stadium, basing it on the altar of Zeus. And I think you can see the, the connection there. Most of Hitler's speeches at Zeppelinfeld were delivered at nighttime. Look at all the floodlights into the sky. Uh, an unheard of, unprecedented kind of thing. It made quite an impressive spectacle, especially when you consider that electricity was not nearly as prevalent as, as, it, was to, as it is today. It would look great today to see something like this. It must have looked absolutely uh, stellarly divine <laughs> to the people of that time. And think of his powerful voice telling these people how wonderful they are, how much more effective the setting was for him to make these speeches, how much more effective he must have been in convincing them. And folks, when I think back on Pergamon and I think of Antipas of Pergamon roasting alive inside of a brass bull at the great altar of Zeus, I also think of the Holocaust. Not hard to make a connection to what happened to the Jewish people that were rounded up and taken to the camps and the furnaces that were there. Six million people, Jewish people. Jesus said that in the first century AD, Satan's throne was in Pergamum. Satan lived in that city. Maybe Satan knew some 200 years before that that this new great altar of Zeus that was built in Pergamum in that, at that time, perhaps he knew that one day that would be his throne. Perhaps he had it designed specifically for that purpose. And then maybe in 1930, maybe he decided to move his throne. Maybe in 200 BC, he already knew that where his throne would be in 1930 AD. There is a conspiracy going on here. After all, who knows? I have to wonder, where's his throne at today? Way back in 2009, Barna Research surveyed 1,871 Americans, each, who each considered himself or herself a Christian. Okay, they believed themselves to be a Christian. This survey wanted to learn where these American Christians stood on some very basic beliefs. This is kind of an incredible statistic to me. It's not kind of, it is incredible. Four out of ten, fully 40%, that's almost half of these Christians, strongly agreed. You know how you have options on these surveys? Strongly agree, mildly agree, not sure. Mildly disagree, strongly disagree. They strongly agreed. 40% of them agreed that Satan, quote, is not a living being, but is a symbol of evil, end quote. Not really a force, a real force to be reckoned with. It just sort of symbolizes generally evil. 40% of people who claim to be followers of Christ. That's weird to me. Because apparently, folks, Jesus believed in Satan, okay? He believed that Satan had his throne at one time in the city of Pergamum. Well, let's put it this way. Jesus knew that that was the case. Jesus spoke of Satan often. I think Jesus believes, he knows, that Satan exists. That's who tempted him, offered him all those kingdoms. I guess that today, Satan can pretty much put his throne anywhere he wants to, Nobody will really notice or care very much which city it may happen to be in. I've heard it said that the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he did not exist. As long as he gets his way, he doesn't care whether you believe in him or not. Okay? Just as long as he has his influence and can keep it going. That's where his concern is. Now, quickly, we talked about them last week, but here are some th more things regarding the Nicolaitans. 
Okay, Jesus said to the church at Pergamum, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. John MacArthur said in his comments on this, this heresy was similar to the teaching of Balaam, okay, the heresy of, of the Nicolaitans. Nicholas, the word Nicholas means one who conquers the people. And then uh, MacArthur <coughs> enlightens us here. Irenaeus, okay, Irenaeus was two generations away from the Apostle John. Polycarp came in the middle. You may remember we talked about them at one point. Irenaeus writes that Nicholas, who was made a deacon in Acts chapter 6, was a false believer. Remember, he was the, the, the last one in the list, okay, that we looked at. Who He later became apostate. But because of his credentials, being a deacon from the church in Jerusalem, he was able to lead the church astray. And like Balaam, he led the people into immorality and wickedness. Okay? The Nicolaitans, followers of Nicholas, were involved in immorality and assaulted the church with sensuous temptations. You see, the church at Pergamum was allowing these Nicolaitans a place at their table. All right, well, what do you have to say? Well, this is what we think. You know, fellowshipping with them, breaking bread with them. Folks, please take heed to this. The most likely means of leading God's people astray into heresy and apostasy is done by the work of an individual teacher or leader. One person who basically takes the place of Christ. It's that spirit of Antichrist. We've seen it with Nimrod. We talked about it briefly with Balaam. And now we're talking about it here with Nicholas and the Nicolaitans. It's also true of someone like Muhammad, okay, with Islam. More especially true with Joseph Smith of Mormonism, taking the Christian religion and pulling it away, taking it in a different direction. Charles Taze Russell, Jehovah's Witnesses, a Sunday school teacher gone awry. That was Russell, okay? One man or one woman gets an unbiblical idea. People become engaged with it, and they follow that person. Jesus warns the Pergamon saints, therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. The sword of the Lord is his word of truth. And oh, how we need that truth today. We need to be discerning people. The tongue of a false teacher can bring destruction to many. Such so-called wisdom is earthly wisdom. It's sensual wisdom. It's also demonic. The Bible tells us that, that there will be doctrines of demons in the last days. Can you see then how in Jesus' letter here, the false teaching creeping into the church of Pergamum, the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, how it's linked to the fact that Satan's throne and his dwelling are in that very same city. How important this is for our day. We need to hear this message in our churches. And this leads us right into Jesus' letter to the church at Thyatira. And wow, we are running out of time. I'm going to run uh, just quick slides here for you uh, towards the end here as we finish this up. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and, and uh, whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the ones you did at the first. But this I have against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality, and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw, throw her onto a sick bed, and will, um, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation. Terrible woman here, unless they repent of her works. 
They have to repent of her works. Notice that, the influence of a teacher. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's the end of chapter 2 right there. The Thyatirans are commended for their love and their faith, their service, their patient endurance, and for the works they did greater than the ones at the beginning. But Jesus criticizes them for tolerating a woman with a spirit like Jezebel who all in herself is teaching the very same Gnostic slash Nicolaitan heresy we've already seen. Food to offered to idols, particularly that, and sexual immorality. The, the glorification of the flesh, because the flesh is all evil anyway. We might as well enjoy ourselves while we're here, and, and God will take care of our spirits, right? Because you can live however you want in your body. Your spirit is covered in God's grace. That's what they believed. Hence, she was teaching and practicing in the church, okay? Understand that. Sexual immorality, and she was feasting on meats that had been used in pagan worship. Worship. Okay, Revelation 2.18. Uh, uh, Jesus instructs the ones in the church who do not believe this pagan teaching, by the way, to hold on to the good things they've been taught until he comes back. All right? Let's quickly go through some highlights from Jesus' letter here. Uh, to the church of the angel of the church in Thyatira, write the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. All right, again, we see a connection to the description of Christ from chapter 1. Eyes of fire, feet of bronze. There were metal workers in Thyatira. There may be an attempt to make a connection to them in some way, but I think really what we're talking about here, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming as the judge. His eyes pierce and judge and discern. His feet carry out that judgment. They, they come again in judgment. Okay, that's what he's doing. He's coming as the judge. Okay, uh, love and patience are prerequisites for service, to rightly serve someone. Look at what it says here. I know your works, your love, your faith, your service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. Okay, uh, to rightly serve somebody, you have to love them. All right. You, otherwise, your motive might be some sort of self-ennobling kind of gratification. I like it how I feel so good whenever I help somebody. You know, that's not the motivation to do good for other people. That's worrying about, you know, well, how you feel after it's all done. Sometimes helping somebody doesn't make you feel so good, but you got to help the person. To truly love someone, you must know what's best for them. And then you seek out how to best bring that about in their lives. Uh, and to know what is truly best for others, one needs to have a standard by which they can refer, to which they can refer so you know what's best. And, of course, that standard would be the Word of God. Okay, but Jesus' criticism of this church uh, is on, focuses all on this woman, Jezebel woman, he calls her. Calling her Jezebel, that's an intentional reference to the Old Testament Jezebel. All right, the pagan wife of King Ahab, back in the days of the prophet Elijah. All right, Jezebel, there's a whole story here. Hang in there, folks. Jezebel represented a compromise of the truth of God's word. All right. Ahab's marriage to Jezebel, it was an economic arrangement, a political thing. It was an attempt to preserve trade. See, uh, between northern Israel and Phoenicia. Okay, Phoenicia is out on the Mediterranean coast, the western coast of Israel. Phoenicia is there, the land of Phoenicia. And Jezebel, okay, she was from the famous Phoenician port city of Tyre the capital city of the Phoenician Empire. The Phoenicians had a very prosperous international trade going all throughout the Mediterranean, okay? And Ahab, living inland, he had no port city. He wanted a piece of that action. Marrying Jezebel because she was the princess, okay? 
That was a means of him arranging trade agreements. There's money in this for him. But it's also a dangerous spiritual compromise for which Israel paid dearly. In 1 Kings 16, 30-33, we read, And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the, the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. That's a pole. All right, a pole set up for worship. Think of a maypole if you're familiar with those. That's a carryover from pagan religious beliefs. Okay. Anyway, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. And there were some pretty crummy guys in that list. Ahab had this pergamy marriage, right? A mixed marriage spiritually mixed be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers that's what's happening here and it cost him and it also cost the nation he was ruling those in powers high crimes misdemeanors they're called that because they impact more people they have a greater range when someone at the top fails so miserably jezebel her for herself she was like an on-fire missionary for the religion of baal and asherah she set out to make converts of the whole nation of israel and her husband he was only too willing to roll over weak-minded all right and wanting to get his way uh, and cooperate with her project to do all this see jezebel's father ethbaal before he would act as king first and foremost he is the priest of the goddess Astart there, a Greek name. Astart was known in Hebrew as Ashtoreth. Another name for her was Ishtar. The Greeks called her Aphrodite. You've probably heard of that. The Romans knew her as Venus. This goddess's focus was fertility. That's like prosperity, right? There's sexual overtones there, but there's also prosperity. And of course, sexuality is something she's also over. And violence or war tied into the first two. Uh, think about the, the civilizations once again and the things happening with that. Various symbols were associated with her. The lion, the horse, the sphinx, the dove, and also a star with a circle indicating the planet Venus. So Ethbaal, he's a priest and a king. And his name was a title meaning one who rules with Baal. He was described as one who rules by Baal's authority and rules in Baal's place. He takes the place of Baal. According to Stephen Jones, in his book entitled The Seven Churches, in Roman terminology, he would be the vicar of Baal. See, the Roman religion uh, in Rome, there is a vicar, the vicar of Christ, the one who has taken the place of Christ on earth, okay, um, think about that spirit of Antichrist there, uh, the vicar of, of Rome. Okay, This is the vicar of Baal. The kingdom of Tyre in the days of Jezebel was a religious kingdom of Baal on earth, and its high priest ruled supreme as king. Okay, And then Jones says this, this sheds much light on Ezekiel chapter 28. That's where it talks about the anointed cherub who was in the Garden of Eden and stayed there until iniquity was found in him and he fell. Talking about Satan. So he says, this sheds much light on Ezekiel 28, which compares the beautiful city of Tyre, which is also in Ezekiel 28, and the prince of Tyre there, appears the beautiful city of Tyre to the Garden of Eden and compares the prince of Tyre, Ethbaal, to the tempter in Eden. Okay, so Ethbiel, as prince of Tyre, he's linked to Satan, the tempter in Eden. Jones goes on to talk about Ahab's link to Baal through Jezebel, Ethbiel's daughter. King Ahab of Israel married Jezebel, and in so doing, he joined himself with her god Baal. You see what happens? Mixed marriages never work. You end up giving yourself over to the god of, of uh, the, 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 the pagan. That's what happened here anyway. Thus he placed Israel under the power of the kingdom of Baal on earth. And this set the stage for an era in which Ethbaal, 
through his daughter Jezebel, she was the real, he was the real power behind Israel's monarchy. Ahab was a mere king. Ethbaal was a king of kings to all who worship Baal. Does that sound like one who's trying to take the place of Christ? The saying, in Israel, the laws of Baal replaced the laws of God as given by Moses. And look at this, it became unlawful to think differently. Oh, they had thought police. You know, you can't have hate crime. Anyway, Jezebel then persecuted the true prophets of God and the remnant of grace during the days of Elijah. So, Ezekiel the prophet compares the prince of Tyre to Satan the tempter, and in the days of Elijah the prophet, uh, Ethbaal is the prince of Tyre. Hey, did anybody notice that Tyre here and Thyatira sound very similar? Well, there happens to be a connection. According to Jones in his book on the seven churches of Revelation, uh, there is a connection. The city of Tyre, you see, on the coast there, was actually in two parts. One part was on the coast itself of the mainland, and there was a second part of the city that was on an island offshore. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon conquered the land portion in like the 6th century B.C., but he couldn't get out to the island. That's where most of the people had gone. Okay, so that's Nebuchadnezzar. Well, come along about 300 years later, Alexander the Great took care of all that because he used the ruins of the old city of Tyre, the stuff that Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian troops left behind. He took the ruins and he built a land bridge to get himself out to the island, and he took his army out there and conquered them. Oops, you know. Uh, by the way, that also fulfilled a prophecy that Ezekiel made about the collapse of Tyre. Now get this, when Alexander died, Seleucus, one of his generals, who had been at the defeat of Tyre, he was there for that battle, well, he gained control of Asia Minor once, once uh, Alexander died. Uh, he had four generals, and they divided it up with much infighting between themselves. And, and Seleucus got Turkey, okay, Asia Minor. And shortly before Seleucus dies, he founds the city of Thyatira. That means New Tyre. He was reflecting back on the glory days when they built that bridge, see? And he names it New Tyre. Now, this is where it gets to be a little fun. Now, the Hebrew name for Tyre is Tsur. All right, Tsur. I think I went too far here. Tsur. That, that means rock or fortress. According to the International Bible, Standard Bible Encyclopedia, Thyatira uh, means the castle of Thyatira. All right, Tyra, the castle, rock. It's all sort of part of that fortress. Later in history, the city was named, renamed Akhisar, that's the Turkish language, Akhisar, and that means White Castle, okay? All right, so we have the White Castle here, Akhisar. And Hazor, that's a city that's mentioned in Joshua chapter 11. Joshua comes in to conquer Canaan. He goes up and takes the city of Hazor. It may have well have been the pronunciation Hatsur, Hatsur, okay, which means the rock, okay? Hatser means the rock. And the name Hazor comes from the, the Hebrew word Chatsar, okay, which basically means castle. So all this is intertwined. The Turkish Hisar is the same as the Hebrew Hazor. Both mean castle. Both are linked to Hatser or the city of Tyre. Okay, so there's that whole thing going on. And the modern name of Thyatira happens to be Hassar. Stephen Jones concludes this, putting all these facts together, we can say that there is a spiritual connection and very possibly a physical connection between the city of Tyre and the city of Thyatira. Notice we're still talking about cities. We've been talking about cities all night long. Both names incorporate the concept of a rock, fortress, or castle. Yet there are other striking similarities. Both cities worship the sun god and a female counterpart. Both cities were famous for their purple dye. Both of them had trade unions or guilds to protect themselves from competition. All these connections. As he offered to Jesus the temptation... Something's wrong here. There we go. 
As he offered to Jesus in temptation, Satan has control of the kingdoms of this world. In both of the letters that we've looked at this evening, we have seen how the evil spiritual realm, with Satan in both Pergamum and in Berlin, and with fallen spiritual beings posing as gods and goddesses in both Tyre and Thyatira, how they can stretch their influence across the centuries. There is supernatural evil behind this thing, folks. It's a fascinating insight for us, really. And most amazingly, we see that Jesus subtly makes this connection for us in both letters. What to us, with just a cursory reading of these letters, uh, would not appear to be significant, actually becomes the centerpiece in each of the letters. Consider the extent of the earthly timeline that we saw here tonight. Hang with me, folks. I'm almost done. It's really quite remarkable. In Ezekiel's prophecy of Tyre, he goes all the way back to the tempter of Satan, the very beginning of the book of the Bible, that old serpent in the garden. Joshua figures in, Joshua chapter 11, and where he conquers Hatzur, or Hazor, likely conquering the city of Tyre. So Joshua factors into this. In the days of Ezekiel, Nebuchadnezzar attempts to totally conquer Tyre, but he only succeeds in bringing down the coastal portion. Nearly 300 years later, Alexander the Great takes what Nebuchadnezzar had left, and he uses it to build a bridge to the island portion of Tyre, bringing it down. And you can see that bridge has kind of expanded over the years, as they've apparently added more landfill. Seleucus is there for that event, and after Alexander's death, he becomes ruler of Asia Minor, where right before he dies, he founds the city of New Tyre, or Thyatira, making that connection. About 70 years later, in nearby Pergamum, close to Thyatira, that's where the great altar of Zeus is built. More than 200 years after that, two uh, uh, churches are established in both Pergamum and Thyatira, and through the Apostle John, Jesus writes a letter to each, making for us all of the connections that we have been privy to this evening. In fact, I think Jesus makes a particularly telling point when he calls the evil woman in Thyatira Jezebel. With almost a thousand years between them, these two Jezebels are of the same nature. It really convinces me that there is such a thing as a Jezebel spirit, which, by the way, hasn't gone anywhere. Many contemporary commentators see evidence of the Jezebel spirit in churches today. That bears more study on our part. We should look into that. Then incredible as it might seem, the link stories continue on down to our own time frame through German archaeology and ultimately to the hideously infamous Nazi regime. Wow, folks. Did you survive all of that? <laughs> Did you make it through it tonight? Thank you for sticking with me, for those of you that, had, that have. Uh, uh, anyone who says that Bible study is boring hasn't really given it a shot. Next week, we will get into chapter 3 with the letters to the churches in Sardis in Philadelphia. Thank you so much. Hang in there uh, for hanging in there with me tonight. Uh, we'll see you uh, on Sunday, so to speak, and hopefully next Wednesday as well as we continue our study of these seven cities, these seven churches. God bless.